Thank you for the chance to give the final talk of the semester. OK, I'll start with some notation. So in the talk, x to n omega is going to be, oh, by the way, this is a joint work with Alex Zinger. It's going to be a compact symplectic manifold. Or if you are algebraic geometry, it's going to be a complex projective, uh, complex projective ride. Uh, v, which is a field co-dimension 2 inside x, this is a smooth symplectic divisor or symplectic submanifold. Or if you're algebraic geometry, it's just a, a smooth divisor. J is going to be an almost compass structure. And in the relative case, which, which tames or is compatible with omega. And in just a remark, in the relative case, whenever there is a V in the picture, J should preserve, uh, G, J should be compatible with the divisor in the sense that when you restrict it to V, it's an almost complete structure on V, plus some higher, plus some integrability condition. In the normal direction to V, to the first order in normal direction. Then the main examples are going to be, well, either the projective space for with a divisor of degree d, hyper, like div divisor being a degree delta hypersurface. Or if you're doing simple, you know, simple geometry purely, uh, so if omega is in the H2 of xq, then by Donaldson we know that there are symplectic divisors, v in class delta omega for delta very large number. So these are the main examples. Uh, I'll give a brief review to the absolute case, the absolute Gromov-Witten theory. The modular space in the problem is the following. So absolute modular space, which I denote by m bar g k x a here g is the genus so g bigger than zero genus k bigger than zero or b or equal to zero is the number of mark points a is some homology class in h2 lower h2 and this space is the a space of maps from nodal domains of genus G with some mark points, so like x1, x2, up to xk, into x, so a map with a map u, such that, so this is the domain sigma, nodal domain with complex structure J and mark points x1 to xk, such that del bar of u with respect to j on the target and little j on the domain, which is given by 1 over 2 du plus j du j is 0. So these are holomorphic maps with respect to the almost complex structure j on the target and little j on the domain. So this is a compact modular space. Uh, and we have two kind of maps. One is the evaluate, like one, the, the, the first kind are like evaluation maps, eval E1 to EV1 to EVK, which go to X. EVI sends like sigma J X1 to XKU to just U of XI. And we also have a stabilization map, which forgets about the map just looks at the domain, the domain with the mark points is something in the delay mom for a space. So that goes into the M bar GK. No maps.
Then go more with an invariance. So if you have homology classes alpha j in the H star of x, and some homology class beta inside H star of the limon for the space, then go more with an invariant of x with respect to genus G class A with inputs alpha 1 to alpha k and with restrict restriction on the domain given by beta is just the integral over the modulus space of the pullbacks of these forms uh, alpha 1 and then wedge beta so I mean, this has to be interpreted because this is not always a manifold. It's not even an orbifold. It, I mean, so in general, we say virtual, which means you have to make sense of this integral. I'm not going to go into the details of that until the examples. And this is called the gamma with an invariant with these inputs. So geometrically, in the geometric situations where this is actually an orbifold, so in geometric situations, This number is the count of number of curves in degree A genus G with, with the specified constraints, with the specified So the constraint beta on the domain, beta de de describes the type of domain that can go into that picture. And alpha 1, alpha 2, okay, the, I mean, they tell you, like, if you look at the Poincard, all of them, it tell you that the map should pass through those constraints. Okay, so this is the absolute version. Now, for the relative version, we are going to have a divisor. So. So if you have the divisor, so you can look at the intersection of that with the homology class A, that's a number, you can decompose it into some part, uh, you can partition it into some non-zero numbers, or maybe zero, like if, if you do zero, we don't write them. So SI's, so just this is the SI is bigger than zero, unless there is, unless this thing is zero, which would be empty, nothing. And we look at the following modulus space. So then M, G, K, S. S is going to be the ordered pair of these numbers, an ordered tuple of these numbers. And X, V, A. So here, in addition to the ordinary mark points, we are going to have some special mark points. So still you have so it's a space of maps like in curves like geolomorphic maps where you have some ordinary mark points and when you look at the intersection of this curve with the divisor so it's going to intersect at a couple of points what you want is that when you look at the intersection the u inverse of v is equal to sum of si yi, where this y1 to yl are the just the, so y1 to yl are the contact points. With me. So si describes the order of tangency. Here, for example, you have s1 equal to 2 and s2 equal to 1. And these mark points should be all these things, like yi's and xi's should be all these things. So, any question? So, I mean, I haven't put the bar yet because I haven't compactified it yet. So, then the problem is how to compactify this space. So.
And the issue is the following. So for example, if you have the divisor V and a J-holomorphic map, which intersects V at two points, say Y1, Y2, what can happen is that this curve, like let, let me call the image C, some portion of the tar image can sink into the divisor. So in the limit, No, the marksman should be disjoint from the intersection point. So the total, I mean, you are going to have k plus l mark points. k of them are the ordinary mark points. l of them are the intact, uh, contact points. So you might have some points here as well. What can happen is that some portion of the curve can sink into the divisor. So in the, in the limit, you can have some portion of this sinking into the divisor and some, some other portion by intersecting non-trivially. So, and the image of these y1s, y, like y1, 1, 2, with, with some like two points on the part which is inside v, like this is c1, this is c2. And so for the part c2, which is inside the v, the contact order doesn't make sense because the curve is totally inside it. So to be able to capture this contact data, what we do here is that as this thing sinks into the, the part, we look at the component on the, on the limit which is sinking. And you look at the part of the curve which is converging to that, that would give you a section. So we will get a meromorphic section over C2 with zeros. at y1, y2, and maybe pulls somewhere else. So, and this, like a section, this is like a section of normal bundle of V to X restricted to C2. And this section is only well defined up to CSR action because I'm getting the section by doing the rescaling so we can just change the whole like rescaling by a constant number. It doesn't change anything. So they'll define up to total CSR action. And here to get the CSR action, we actually need the condition that I wanted on the being first order, in the first order being like that integrable. We want the almost complex structure to be integrable in the force in the, to the first order in the normal direction so that the linearization of J-Holomorphic uh, equation is complex linear and this thing is actually well defined up to C S star. Okay, so the picture that corresponds to this data, so the data here would be C1 and C2 plus the data of the section. The way we visualize this is that in the ordinary compact equation of the com classical modular space, you consider not all domains. Here, you also have to consider not all targets, which means, OK, the C1 is going to live inside x. So this is x, this is a divisor, and this is the C1. A section over C2, a section over C2 can be, when you put them together, you can think of as a map. So these two can be taught. as a map into projectivization of the normal bundle. So projectivization of normal bundle is some P1 bundle over V with two sections at zero at infinity, V0, V infinity. So the picture corresponding to this, would, so if you have zeros here, and a pole here, which would join the zero on the other side. So here you have matching node. And then the, the, the information of S, the contact vector, has a, is recorded at the last copy of V that you have. You, ha you can have more of these PVs just going down, but, but a finite number. And the information of S is recorded here. Manifold is integrable and you have some condition. The, the assumption is that J preserves TV. 
but it's the j when you look at it in the normal direction to v is integrable to the first order. Not, not, the, not, not, not. Otherwise, it's otherwise, you don't get CS star action. No, but when you do the same meromorphic section over z2. So z, so z2 is, is a part of the curve in. Inside that, c is a section of the norm line bundle over that, and you can. Uh, Yes, to get the CS direction. And the importance of the CS direction is that so, so in this picture, in this compactification of modular space, the part of the curve which is mapped into the PV is only well defined up to CS direction. And because of that, if you look at the compactification, minus what you started with, So what you're adding is virtual equal dimension two. Because of CS star action. Because you're modding, modding out by CS star, so you're reducing a dimension by two, by real two, or complex dimension one. Yeah, so for example, if you have, you, if this is like sinking to here, you'll get some trivial fiber with the mark points on that. Just one comment, you can define everything which I did in terms of SFT picture. In that picture, you would re remove V and you look at the, j instead of contact points, you will consider punctures going to infinity, like converging to rib orbits. And for the almost complex structure, you, co you would consider almost complex structure, which are like, uh, trans like have translation symmetry and the S1 symmetry. That would simplify the analysis a lot. But the drawback is that almost always so those J's are not integrable. So if you want to do some, if you want to look, get some conclusions for the algebraic geometry, that might not be the best way to approach it. But the analysis in the SFT picture would be, from the SFT picture would be much easier because of the symmetry of the almost complex structure that you have. Okay. Now, I have in this picture, in this I think I'll ha I'm going to have the same kind of evaluation maps as before with one more. So you would have evaluation maps to X relative evaluation maps to uh, V at the contact points and a stabilization map to M bar G K plus L. So that looks at the domain, that looks at the relative mark points, that would look at the interior mark, I mean the classical mark points. Now you can define go relative gormal with M invariance once you s either show that the modular space is a nice orbifold or if you cook up a virtual fundamental class and then you can define the relative invariance by GVX GWXV GAS and the inputs can be cohomology classes from X a cohomology class from the dilemma for the space or cohomology classes from the relative for the relative points. So that would be equal to integral over the modular space. So classical evaluation maps and then a stabilization, the pullback with the stabilization map of beta, and finally the pullback with the relative map. Uh, evaluation maps of the relative constraints. Once you make sense of the virtual fundamental class here, or once you cook up a nice orbifold structure on the modular space, you can define these maps. This, this, gromo with an this relative gromo with an invariance. In this picture, geometrically, what we're counting is the number of J holomorphic 
curves which are not inside V. So geometrically, if you arrange for everything to be geometric, then this is like this GV is the number of is the count of curves with a specified constraints that are not inside V. So that's the difference with the classical case. Now, let me write an example to see how the two compactifications are different. Let x be p2. Let the divisor to be just p1 inside p2. Let the homology class to be class of just a line. And then genus to be 0. So if you consider the modular space of genus 0, no mark point, inside p2 in the class 1, that's just the space of the lines inside P2, which is isomorphic to P2 itself. Now, if you consider the modular space of relative maps, so in this case, a line will intersect P2. A line is a P, and the, the divisor is also a line. So A dot V would be equal to 1. So the only partition is just 1. In this case, the relative modular space with genus 0, again, no mark point contact vector 1, P2, P1, and homology class degree 1. So if you first start from the modular space before compactification, you can, you can allow any line except the one which is sinking. So here is like the divisor. Here is any line. If the line is not supported on the divisor, that's good. But if it's on the supported, we have to put it away. For, for at the beginning. So at the beginning, this is just P2 minus one point, the point that corresponds to the line V. Now when you try to, compactific uh, to compactify it, so you have to consider this sinking here, and that gi would give you a section of O1 up to C star action. The number of holomorphic sections of O1 is has dimension 2 up to series direction, you get just one dimension. And the only information that matters is the, where is it intersecting. You have a, like a whole P1 worth of where can this intersect. So what you're going to replace with this point that you have removed is a copy of P1. So this is going to be below up of P2 at the point that corresponds to V. So after compactification, the, the, the classical modular space would be just P2, isomorphic to P2. The relative modular space would be below up of P2 at the point that corresponds to this device. So in geometric, in geometric situations, that's most of the time the picture. That one is a birational transformation of the other. Now, here's the thing. So if you consider the, the compare the dimension of the relative and classical modular space, dimension of MGK XA minus, this is the virtual dimension, M bar G K S X V A. The difference of the dimensions is equal to sum of si minus 1, i equal to 1 to l. So in fact, this would be 0 if the contact vector is just trivial. If s is equal to the trivial contact vector 1, 1, 1, 1. In that case, 
we can think of comparing these numbers. Otherwise, like the dimensions are different. So in this case, the dimensions would be equal when you consider a trivial contact vector, all transverse uh, contact, uh, contact. And you can think, uh, you can ask about the comparison between these two numbers. So then the question is, can you compare GWX, GA alpha 1, alpha k, beta, and GWX relative to V, same input, no relative uh, input, just the classical case. So what is the relation between these two? Or what is the relation? Just so that's the question when, OK, when, when the contact vector is just trivial 1. So in general, as we saw, if the divisor contains lots of curves, the compactifications can be quite different. So here is a definition that would help us to simplify this problem to, th to something which is more approachable. So the difference we now concerns j holomorphic curves which go into V. So what if we don't have such curves? So I'll, I'll write the definition. There are three versions of this definition, but all, the th all three of them are going to work for, th for the theorem, which I'm going to say. But that depends on how you would like to phrase your thing. So we say V is G A hollow if the following conditions uh, happen. So in the first version, you can say if there exists a symplectic form on V, an almost composite structure on V, such that no non-constant, so there are not, there is no any non-constant J-holomorphic curve. In V below genus G and degree A, with G prime less than G and omega of A prime less than omega A. If below G and A, there is no non-constant J-holomorphic curve in B. That's one definition. Another version of this definition is the following, which is more easier to work with. We say V is G A hollow if virtual dimension of the moduli spaces of uh, M G prime X A prime is negative for all such for all such g prime and a prime. So this is easy to describe. That happens only. I mean, if a prime dot v is bigger than first chain class of a apply x applied to a prime plus n minus four. This is like a numeric. Numerical condition which can be checked easily. So that's why, that's like so. If a prime dot v is bigger than this for all a prime g prime below this, then this condition holds. And the way which we achieve is, is we choose a divisor which is very positive, like it's high degree, so that the, the degree should depends on g and a, so that for all a prime and g prime below g and a, this condition holds. And the third definition that you can use in the theorem, which I'm going to write, is that the Gromov with an invariance x g prime a prime are zero for all such a prime g prime. We can use any of these definitions in the theorem, which I'm going to write now. Any ambiguity with the definition? So you want your Yeah, so there is no curve. Uh, basically, the same thing. There is no curve in genus G prime, A prime, in, in V, sorry, where G prime and A prime are below G and A. But the easiest uh, definition to work with is the, the, the middle one. That's a numerical one. You can easily see for which degree of V, divisor V, this is going to happen. OK, then the theorem is the following.
if you look at the absolute Gromov with an invariant of degree g a alpha upon alpha k beta, that's equal to 1 over L factorial, the relative version, So if V is G A hollow, then this equality holds unless one of the following cases. So there are some special cases that this doesn't happen. First of all, the reason for L factor is that here you have the contact points, they are ordered. So you have like L factorial choice of ordering them. You have to divide by one over, you have to divide by L factorial to cancel out the effect of that. And so the case is that this doesn't happen is the following. So these numbers are equal except these cases. One is, g equal to 1, a equal to 0. So degree 0 maps with genus 1. The other bad case is genus bigger than or equal to 2, and n less than or equal to 4. If you put beta equal to 1, if you put no constraints on the domain, with no constraints on domain, The statement is so beta equal to one. Then the statement is that so it's unless again g equal to one, a equal to zero, uh, g bigger than or equal to three, n equal to four. So in lower dimensions and g is bigger than or equal to two, this equality doesn't hold in general. If you just look at the classical Gromov with invariance, with no, I mean, with if you look at the Gromov with, with an invariance without any restriction on the domain, then the same the same theorem holds, except in these cases, except when the dimension is precisely four, and genus is bigger than or equal to three, and this trivial case of a equal to zero genus one. Any question on this statement? No, I'll, I'll talk about the motivation. So first of all, you see from here that the genus 0 is fine. So the genus 0 case was proved by chilibek monke Let me write it correctly. Uh, that's 2007. The high genus case was attempted by Yonel Parker and Gertzenberger, but uh, the statement wasn't true. So this is the correct statement after some adjustments. I'll talk about the motivations. Let me write the example. So in the except in these cases, the theorem holds. Now, the theorem doesn't say anything specific about the those the special cases, but these are the examples which would cover, these are the content, like the con but, but was it, their claim was that something like this should be always true. That's always true. So the, ter the, the theorem in the Union Park, the, the version before, was this is always true for any genus, any, no, no restrictions here. So they missed this case. But there are also conditions like, uh, there's no condition like hollow or something. Well, yeah, there is a condition. There yeah, they had a, so they use Donaldson divisors of, they consider the Donaldson divisors of higher degree, which are GA hollow when you choose the degree high enough by the reason which I wrote there, by the second condition. When the divisor is high degree enough, it's GA hollow, so that, so that condition holds. But there are these examples which they missed by some miscalculation. And then, uh, so is the, is the theorem false? So these are here, yeah, so that's what, that's what I'm going to write. So this is, these are the counterexamples to the cases which I which the theorem doesn't cover. So example one, which is related to K 
case one. So all divide into two cases. One alpha, one beta. One beta is the second case where you consider, no, one beta is the first case. One alpha is the second case when you consider beta equal to one. One beta is when you have actually some beta. So in this case, if you consider the Gromov with an invariant, the classical one, genus zero, and genus one degree zero, and with the constraints alpha one, so non constraints from the dilemma for space, but you have alpha, which is something arbitrary inside H2 of X. Then that's equal to, you can explicitly calculate. I'll talk about the calculation and then the motivation behind the theorem. Cn minus 1 of x uh, times alpha integrated over x divided by 24. This is the classical one. The relative one is going to be, so same input. There is no, so because degree is 0, there is no intersection, so the contact vector is empty, um, xv, oops, the input is going to be again alpha 1. This number is equal to, you have the same factor plus this additional term, alpha restricted to v times cn minus 2 of v integrated against v divided by 24. So that's the difference between the two numbers in, the, in this case. For the case that you consider non-trivial non beta, for example, you can consider uh, beta to be just Poincaré dual of a point inside H star of M11, which means you fix the J on the genus one curve. And alpha to be just one, nothing about the alpha. And then gamma with an invariant of x, one, zero, the classical one, would be equal to Euler characteristic of x divided by two. The number two in the denominator is because every point, any, every genus one curve has automorphism. And the, the relative version would be Euler characteristic of x divided by 2 minus Euler characteristic of v divided by 2. So these are the differences between the two. So these are the examples for 1 and the 1 without any constraint from the Dele Montfort. So this is the one with no constraints on the domain, and this is the one with a constraint on the domain. Oh, oh. Now, for the example two, I'll consider P1 with a divisor delta points. So example two, let x to be P1. We can choose anything up to dimension four that it's going to work. But simply, I'll consider x equal to p1. Let v be equal to v delta, like delta points. So a divisor inside p1 is just a couple of points. And for the homology classes alpha, I'm going to consider the point homology, uh, the uh, homology classes corresponding to a point. So two mark, I'm going to have two mark points. And the alpha 1, alpha 2 would be just Poincare dual of a point inside h2 of p1. And the alpha is, the beta is going to, like, Beta is going to be coming from this picture. Inside genus, a space of genus two curves, you can look at those of them, those who have like a spherical bubble with the two mark points on that. So that would give you something inside H2 of M bar 2, 2. And what we are going to use is beta to the power 4. Then the Gromov with invariance, the classical one, which is going to be 1 over 240 by the Groy program of Gottman. GW of P1, genus 2, degree 1 inside P1, with constraints point, point on the mark point and the restriction beta to the power 4 
from the Dillon Manfer space, that's equal to this number. You can use it, calculate it using the Groy program of Gottman. So the question is whether this is equal to, so A dot V is equal to delta here, one over delta factorial, relative one, GW of P1, relative to the V delta, it's still genus two, degree one, contact vector trivial, one, 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 one. Same input. And the answer is no, they are not equal. The difference is the following. The difference is delta over one over one, one, five, two. And this one, one, five, two, if you wonder where does it come from, that's equal to some integral over the, the, the limon for this space. So that's the example for two, when you allow genus to be bigger than or equal to two, and n less than or equal to four. So the difference between these two is this number. And finally, the example when you don't allow any constraint on the domain, so the dimension has to be four, the natural example to look at is P4. So XP4, uh, natural divisor is going to be just V delta, some degree delta hypersurface. And the clauses which I'm going to consider are the following. Again, for the alpha, I'm going to choose Poincare dual of a point, and just one of them, so one mark point. The, the homology class would be still degree one. Beta is going to be one, as we said. So this is the example two prime. So not, not, no constraint from the Dillon for it. Then the absolute goal with an invariant is this number. So that's goal with an invariant in X with constraint with you know, genus three and degree one, which has to pass through one point. The question is whether it is equal to the relative version, which is GWP4 with respect to V delta, same input, trivial contact, contact vector. The answer is no, so that divided by delta factor. The answer is no, the difference is going to be this expression here. Seventy-two pi seventy-six, and this number again. Thank you. So these numbers come from this calculation. So the the, the numerator is just some chair number. Is this one? Uh, this one is just integral of some Hodge class. Uh, Hodge classes on the m bar three. It's not actually that, it's just, it's equal to one over four times five times that number. So this is the, that's the statement. These are the examples now. If there's no question, I can go toward details of these things. Any question? So the examples are kind of very non-trivial, like this, especially this one, which is something in P4. This one makes sense, like somehow. You just consider P1 with Dill, but that dimension four is something specific which is causing problem with the uh, uh, classical Gromov with an like the Gromov with an Gromov with an invariant without constraint is just something peculiar. Now let's go to, let's just start with the simplest example, which is the genus one example with degree zero. So why, why, why the numbers are different? How do we calculate them? If you consider modular space of genus one, one mark point, and then in X, homology class zero. Well, Degree zero maps are just constant maps. So here you have just a domain with a point as an image. 
So as a, as a space, this is just x times m11 bar. If you look at the relative version, with the trivial contact. So I'm going to claim that this is still, as a space, equal to this one. So why is it? So this is x, this is v. If you have a curve inside here, the image would be a point. If the point is off v, that's OK. So we have x minus v times that. The problem happens when this sinks into the divisor. Then corresponding to that, so when this thing sinks into the divisor, it's going to shift to the next level. So the image would be some, J, some genus 1 map, some constant map over a genus 1 domain, with the image a point here. A point here is only well defined up to CS direction by the way we compactify my space. So the only information of the point which is in, uh, important is to which fiber it belongs. So the space of fibers is a, equal to V. So Previously, we had x minus v. And then after we comp compactification, we are putting a copy of v. So we still get a copy of x. So as the spaces, they are equal. What is, difference, what is different between the two theories is the deformation theory. So there are two ways of explaining why these numbers are different. The first way, which is like more in favor of algebraic geometry, is by explaining the deformation theories. So. In both of these cases, the obstruction bundle is not trivial. If you look at the linearization of the question one operator, like, like the co-kernel is not empty. There is an obstruction bundle. The top chain clause of that obstruction bundle would give you the gamma of an invariant. In the classical case, the obstruction bundle, so we have, if you have like a map U, you have U star Tx, and then you have the linearization of question on the question one operator into sigma times u star tx. The co-kernel of this one would give you the obstruction bundle. And that's equal to, in this case, the dual of Hodge bundle tensor tx. So this is over m11 bar times x. By calculating the degree of that with respect to the constraints that you put in, you get those numbers. Like the, the, the Euler characteristic of x that we got was coming from here. And the other one was something about, what was the other one? So if you fix j, you don't, you don't have this part. The only part is tx over x. So that's the obstruction bundle over x. You, you consider a section, you consider the degree of that, the degree of zero, the degree of that section, it would be all the characteristics of x. Now, in the relative case, the, the deformation theory is different. While the margin space is the same, the deformation theory is different. In this case, the right deformation theory is the logarithmic version of that. This can be made sense in the simplex geometry too. It's more natural in this, this formulation is more natural in the algebraic geometry. And therefore, the obstruction bundle would be the logarithmic version of this. Still, the E star, but the other copy would be logarithmic version of this thing. Because of that, when you look and calculate the top chain number of this thing, this is going to be Euler characteristic of x minus Euler characteristic of b. So the relative invariant would be Euler characteristic of x minus Euler characteristic, Euler characteristic of v. The classical one would be Euler characteristic of x. From the SFT picture, the way you, look, you see this logarithmic is that you decompose the tangent bundle into horizontal and somehow the, the, the vertical one. In one direction, you have like a different, like you have different condition on the, on, the, on, the, on the vertical one, you have a different. And that's somehow capturing the logarithmic, the definition of logarithmic tangent bundle. Now, from pure simplectic geometry point of view, how we get that no, those numbers? So again, the, the, the Cushion and one operator is not transversal here. 
we have to make it somehow transverse. The idea that Chilibic monkey used was to use like Hamiltonians to perturb the uh, question of my operation. Uh, operator. Uh, I'm going to use the Rwandian method, which is by J, J new map. So we are going to use like the Rwandian J new maps instead of just J holomorphic. So, how is it? So the idea is this. This new term is something which is a section of the following bundle. So that's going to be a section of let. So UGK is the universal curve over the dilemma for the space. You multiply it with x. That's a bundle over the modulus space times x. And you look at the cotangent bundle of the curves, zero one part, tensor width over complex number with Tx. So this perturbation term, which goes into the one to one deformation of cauchy riemann operator, is some term inside that space. And then if you have a map u, from sigma to x, we say u is j nu holomorphic if it satisfies the following equation. Delta, del bar of u at z is equal to nu at the stabilization of z and u of z. That would be a point in the dolly Monfort space, uh, in, in, the, in the universal curve, that would be a point inside x. You look at the new at that point inside this and you want del bar of u to be equal to that so this perturbation would allow you to perturb the cauchy riemann equation and in some cases get rid of the transversality issue now in the example in this in this example how is that so so in this specific example Well, in the classical case, V is going to be a section of sigma times x. This is like when you fix the j, that the universal curve is just a sigma. You have x, and then t sigma 0, 1 tensor tx. Well, for example, you can take this thing. You can take something of the form dz bar tensor psi, where psi is just a section of the x. And this deformation is enough to get the transfer salty. Then j new maps correspond to the zeros of, corresponds to the points which are in the zero of this vector field c, okay, uh, psi. And the number of such points is the Euler characteristic of x. That's how we get the gamma within the ring by, by, by perturbation. Now, if you want to do the relative version, you are not allowed to consider any arbitrary deformation term. You have to, you have to cons like the J, you only, you're only allowed to consider those perturbation terms which are tangent to the divisor with some, again, integrability conditions in the normal direction. So in this case, this, so the space of admissible new for the classical case is something bigger than the admissible ones for the relative case and those which give you regularity are not comparable so those v which give you regularity the subset here, which would give you regularity, is not a subset of regular things here. 
that's what it makes difficult to compare the theories, and that's why the original approaches had mistakes. Like you have to be careful about which kind of perturbation that you use to, to, to define relative invariance. In the relative case, for example, the new that you use should be tangent to the divisor when you restrict to the divisor. So, so the z should be tangent to the divisor when you restrict to the divisor. So in this case, z restricted to b should be inside tangent b. Then when you look at the, uh, the zeros of z, you have some points on the divisor and some points off the divisor. Those which are on the divisor should be excluded by the definition of relative compactification. Because you start from the interior points, these are relative maps, and there is no convergence. So these have to be excluded. There is no, there's nothing converging to these points in the V. So we start from the maps which are not sync, uh, sunk in, uh, which are not sinks inside V, and we only added some sort of maps which allow some sort of sections. But here you have finite things. Nothing is converging to V, so only those points which correspond to uh, zeros of psi away from V are counted. That's why we get Euler characteristic of x minus Euler characteristic of v. Now back to your question about why people care about this. So when you consider a like, very positive divisor, the number of intersections of A with, so A for V very large, A with V would be very large. Therefore, this space gets bigger and bigger. So in the relative case, this would be K plus L. So when you allow when you consider a divisor, you add some extra mark points which correspond to the intersection with that divisors. You're enlarging this space. By enlarging this space, you get more perturbations. And there is more chance of getting transversality by having more uh, perturbations. Especially if the divisor, if the V doesn't have any J-holomorphic map, so which means there is a better chance of starting with a regular, val regular perturbation in the relative case and getting a regular perturbation for the classical case, you would hope that first the numbers would be equal, and then I have enough, I have a, like a perturbation which would give you transversality, so you don't need to use the virtual techniques. That was the motivation behind these works of Yonel Parker uh, and the rest. So they wanted to use this, and assuming that equality holds, define gormov with invariance via relative invariance in this, in this sense, by, by considering perturbation and considering JNU maps and counting them instead of going to virtual techniques. And it fails because of that thing. Like not, it, it's not always true that if you start with a regular, perturb a regular perturbation, that would give you a regular perturbation for the classical case, that they are different. And the different shows up in the calculations in those examples. When you do calculations, you I mean, you do this, you do the dimension counting, you see that all the cases are covered except the cases which I wrote. When you try to write examples in those cases, you see that the numbers don't match. That's it. Thank you. <laughs>